had lunch with I've only been here for three years, uh, but when I when I came here and I was sharing with others that uh, I, I quickly became home for me and feel like we really made the right choice coming to St. Louis in a lot of ways, and that's not just a public uh, address. It, it's truly uh, we truly feel that way. Um, I brought a couple of kids with me. I've got one in Chicago. It's going to college, um, and we've settled in. It's our home. And if we're going to make it our home, we ought to celebrate the great things that St. Louis does. And there's plenty of them. And one of those is the amazing aircrafts that were built not far from here um, at McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing. Uh, and so our plan is to collect the whole group of planes that were built and systematically um, put them out and allow people to see this amazing history in this area, these wonderful planes that have so much history behind them, not only in the community, but what they've done to keep us free and safe and uh, protect us from all the challenges that have been around the world. Um, the planes are still uh, beautiful. They're still uh, incredible. And we went out to look at an F-15, which is the next one that we're working on, uh, out at Rantoul. And the plane's in a little uh, rough condition, but the body's in great shape. Uh, it, it needs a fresh coat of paint. It, of course, we got to ship it, so we can't fly it here, unfortunately. Um, so we'll take the plane, we'll take the uh, wings off, we'll put it on a, a transport, and we'll send it over to, to St. Louis. So in part of that process is we've got to figure all that out. We've got to figure out how we're going to do that, how we're going to pay for it, how we're going to make it all happen. Um, but we're pretty excited about that. We've, uh, with the F-18, we got to meet a lot of you and a lot of others who had specifically worked on that plan. A pride, uh, an amazing pride. And so grandparents were bringing their grandkids showing that was the, the screw that I put in, <laughs> part number 372 dash whatever it was, uh, and, and talk about you know that history. That's what makes uh, those planes come alive for us. Uh, that, that's what really makes it part of the community. And, and that's what we're really excited about. So we were gonna bring you some pictures, you know what it looks like. Um, this one's got kind of a gray fading paint on it. Uh, we'll clean it up, fix it up, make it like the F-18 in its, you know, the way it was designed and built um, by some of you probably in this room, and, uh, and get it out there. Part of the, the other thing that we want to do is not just put a static airplane out. A static airplane is beautiful in its own right, and especially for, you know, individuals like you who love planes. But there's a whole lot of people who can't connect to just a static airplane solely. They need to, to get a little bit deeper in that. So this year we embarked on a project to uh, what we're calling the de-skinning of the F-18. In, in a discussion with John McDonald at his office, uh, you know, he said, you know, the really cool part of the planes, what's inside? You gotta look inside this. You got colleagues and friends of ours with, their, with a group that they have called the Dream Team uh, build an app that when you're looking at the plane, you'll be able to, to move the skin off of the plane, look at the electronics in the plane, look at all the elements of that. Pretty cool stuff. So we think we'll grab a, a group of people that are kind of tech savvy, interested, uh, and want to know a little bit more about what, what's inside, uh, the kind of the secrets of what's inside. Now, it's not all the real, real stuff, because some of that's still protected, but it's a lot of, it's, it's as close as you can get that they'll let us get. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, we'd love to hear from you, Pat, Patty, myself, Kent, if you've got thoughts, ideas, people we should connect with, um, ideas about, you know, if you've got access to, to materials to ship us, help us ship it, or find someone, to, a hangar that we can plop it in. There's some rules about that, but um, there, there's those kinds of things that we'll be looking for and trying to figure out um, to make the process take place. Are there any questions about any of that before I sit down? So 
one last piece uh, is where will it go? Um, and we're still trying to get that all completely figured out. But our thought at this point is to put it um, kind of in a position next to the F, uh, FA-18 on the other side, probably so you'll have the two planes on either side. The other piece of that is that we're, we've secured and will be securing more planes, and we'd like to rotate those out. So we'd like to flip them, if you will. And so we would have a, a kind of a new plane to profile or highlight every couple of years or every year, depending on the frequency of movement that we can do. Um, we think that would be pretty exciting. It would be a, a kind of a fresh thing to see. Uh, places like ours can get really stale if we're not refreshing them all the time. And we've been doing a lot of, uh, with that at the Science Center. And one last endorsement for the Science Center, this is what happens when you invite me up to talk. Um, we uh, have made some pretty significant changes over the last couple of years. Um, we've, we've increased our attendance, our, the people walking through the door by 100,000 in the last two, two years. Um, we've grown our revenues, we've diminished our expenses, we've restructured and re design the team, the, the team that's working in, refocused in on the business that we're doing and doing it well. We use a, a, a thing called the Net Promoter Score, and what the Net Promoter Score does is it says how likely would you be to tell someone else to go to the Science Center? And when I started, it was around in its early 60s, um, which is an okay score, it's not so bad, but now we're 74, 75 this year. So that, that, that change may not seem like much, but that is a almost logarithmic and it's changed. So the team's working really hard. We've got a great group of staff and we're trying to make it a place that everyone, all of you can be extremely proud of. Um, it's your museum. You still have that simulator? We have multiple now. Um, we have multiple simulators. We have um, three simulators. We have one that's kind of what I'll call a family, family simulator um, that has some um, some jet opportunities in it, but it also has different scenarios that you can go through. It's just kind of more like a ride. And then we have two smaller simulators that are two person, and they can go all the way upside down. Um, it's a fighter jet experience. Where and is it in the command center? Yeah, it's in the, yeah, right in that area. Yep, and we still have all the computers back over there too. So there's free opportunities, there's paid opportunities, and there's a little bit of everything in there, yeah. And so that whole area in aviation um, we're going to continue to look at it and see how we want to update it and change it. We received a, a, a significant grant from NASA this year, an $800,000 grant, to build a Mars rover experience called Bridging Earth and Mars. Uh, that will open soon, um, this summer actually. And then we have another space that we will open this summer called, it, we're calling it a maker space for lack of a better term, which will be a design engineering, engineering challenge kind of space that'll let people kind of look into what manufacturing is all about, look into what engineering is all about, and actually get kids' hands on stuff. So take apart an engine. I'd love to get an airplane engine. Um, to have an understanding, because we're losing that, and we need to get that back. And many of us who grew up with dads who are tinkerers, we have those opportunities. So we want to try to get that back and get people's hands um, busy. Those three airplanes up at the National Guard about two or three years ago, I was trying to get those airplanes from our museum across the river, uh -huh. and I talked to a lieutenant colonel, and at that time, one of you folks were talking to him. Me? You. Yes, you sir. remember that? Yes, sir. And for instance, I lost out politically. It's going yeah. from, those aircraft are going to the uh, Ike Skelton uh, facility in Jeff City. Oh, now it's Jeff City. Yeah. The last time I heard was going to go out to uh, Whiteman Air Force Base. So now they change that again. Yeah, the, uh, I think it's going out to the guard. And just all three it. of them? Yes, sir. That, well, that's my knowledge. Well, I'd love to get a hold of that four in the back. That's the best of a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we were trying. Whatever you can do. <laughs> yeah, we were trying for the 15 and the four. Yeah. And politically, I think we had the juice at the time, but then it got delayed and got delayed. Yeah, and right. Some of the Kip Bond stepped down from being a senator, and yeah, we, we didn't didn't quite have enough to get it done. So, so I stood back up because I want to make sure that. Let's, let's see a couple things. One, we are so fortunate to have Bert leading the Science Center. He has really got the Science Center moving and hitting on all cylinders. And, and I'm, I am really, really happy to work with him almost on a daily basis on things. But the reason why I stood up was there's going to be opportunities. For those that, that weren't involved on the FA-18, we had a build day. And we all met out there as volunteers. And we put the wings on that 18. And we, we drove rivets. And we did touch up paint. 
and we had a great time. We had about 50 of us all came out one day and we put that airplane together in a day. And then we got it up on, up on its pedestal the next day. We're gonna do the same thing with this 50. This 50 needs a paint job, so I think there's gonna be some sanding opportunities. There's gonna be some, it needs afterburner cans. Super fun, that's a yeah, super yeah, fun well, topic. You know, it's, <laughs> no, really, to be, <laughs> yeah, to be a part no. of, of bringing that airplane back home, it, it's really gonna be a lot of fun. So if you guys have interest in getting involved, either from a, hey, I would like to, to volunteer some time, or I've got some ideas, or even if you wanna write a small check for us, Patty is our person. I want you guys to contact her during breaks or after the meeting tonight and, and, and talk to her about what ideas you might have, what, what things you might want to do. Uh, that's a big part of what we're doing. The idea of rolling these aircraft yep. is to celebrate just exactly how you're doing it. Yep. If we got a big anniversary for one of these airplanes, we're gonna wanna polish it up and get it Get it standing tall and, and get it out and really celebrate. Really excellent idea. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Those are all. I did not realize you had all these programs going down there. So I appreciate you guys coming out and enlightening us tonight. Thanks. Uh, we, however, we can help in our society. Just let us know. Put the word out to us. We got a big group of people. So. Um, Let's go ahead, and I want to make some introductions here. And there was no guest speaker tonight, no panel discussion like when we had the Voodoo event, but we have some uh, uh, folks that worked on the Street People program. And first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Eric Garrison. Go ahead, Eric. did not work. <laughs> but his father, Pete, surely did. And uh, your father designed all the flight profiles for the Street Eagle. Uh, 1974. He's brought quite a bit of photos and memorabilia tonight, and I'm gonna. We don't have a limit. And I think John. This is John Roberts here, yes. who was a flight test on the program. Right. And he said that my dad was the only civilian pilot to fly the Stig Eagle. That's any any flight that was done by the Stig Eagle wasn't the three ter Air Force test pilots that broke the record. Right. Was my father. But usually, if you just see a F-15, like this is amazing. That, that, John brought this. This is the, the placard of number two airplane. Number seven. Number seven tail. Yeah, that's the real airplane. And that's the real airplane. That's yeah. But anytime you see the white helmet and the airplane is kind of not doing the records, then that's that's my dad. And these are my. This is one of his granddaughters, Cassie, my youngest. She's 22, just started as an engineer at Monsanto. And this is Cole, uh, my middle son. Pete's grandson also, and uh, he's an engineer over in uh, Edwardsville, so. And then the son that I met out of Spirit that day? Yeah, he flew in pilot training. He, flying C he was flying C-5s, and now he's going to be a uh, pilot down at uh, BAN, so he's a dead uh, okay. pilot instructor training. So he's, okay. And um, and then I have uh, my oldest has three kids, so he has three grandkids. <laughs> and there's one other in there. Oh, Trey, he got a business degree, four-year business degree from SIUE. And then he decided he wanted to get his engineering degree. So now he wants to get into aerospace, and he's two years into his second That's wonderful. <laughs> well, one of the items, and I wish we had this, we could maybe pull a table up here and later put all these items up here so you can look at them. But one of the items that Eric brought tonight, this is the actual hold back explosive bolt that was used on the Street Eagle. And uh, we'll get into that with a slideshow in the movie. And John, I'm going to. Uh, Norm Gaddy, for Norm, you're over here. He was, you took care of, the way you put it to me while I go, building the jet and keeping it together, right? Okay. <laughs> so, is there anybody else that I'm missing? I know Jack, you were on the program. Were you on the street people? Yeah. Jack Wilcox was the program. Okay. Anybody else that, up here tonight from, that worked on the street people program? I don't want to look this one. There's Bob back there. I got Vicity. And I want to say this. Thanks to Bob West and Jack Abercrombie right over here. Couldn't have done, and Mark Nankerville couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately. Uh, between you guys sending all the photos and John with your slides. Yeah, uh, Go ahead. I just wanted to add something uh, about 
Pete Garrison. You know. Pete uh, was number two man on the, on the uh, Eagle program and uh, was Irv's backup and flew a lot of the first flights of the 15 as well as uh, this program. And he actually opened the, the, the uh, envelope for the Air Force before they set the records. So he set the records first. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Then we'll show the slideshow, and then we have a short film. A bit heavy, and we weren't worried so much about the fuel. And uh, I was the guy blowing the boat. I had a little switch that was wired up to this bolt that they have over here. And I'm standing out on the edge of the wingtip, and it's about 15 degrees below zero, and the wind's blowing down the runway, and it's colder than you can imagine. And I discover, after owning this box for two months, that I can't get my thumb inside the guarded switch. So I have to take my gloves off. Take my gloves off, stick my hand under the under my armpit like this. And the signal that Pete was going to give me was he was going to <laughs> and he beat the heck out of me. <laughs> John? I learned to wait. John, do you remember what Pete told the, the other three pilots about that? No. He said, when you get out there, don't scratch your nose. <laughs> if you'll excuse me, I'll uh, read these profiles that we worked out in the simulator. Uh, I, I don't have chemo, I have chemo brains, so I don't remember, but I have, have written them down. <clears throat> but the records to uh, 40,000 feet, we uh, did a 5G pull up on, take, on takeoff. So as soon as you got the gear up, went to 5Gs and climbed at 80 degrees. This resulted in a time of 59, 0.38 seconds to 12,000 meters, which is 39,000 feet. <clears throat> Records to uh, above 40,000 feet were flown by a 2.5 G Emmelman to 30,000 feet. In other words, on takeoff, two and a half Gs to perform it, an Emmelman, rolling out on, on, at 30,000 feet and accelerating at that level. Uh, Accelerate, accelerating to a VMAX and then, and then a pull up uh, at VMAX. And uh, 30,000 meters, which is 98,425 feet, was attained in 207.8 seconds from brake release. The biggest problem is getting the gear up after takeoff. <laughs> 250 knots uh, to get the gear up. And the fact is, uh, Jack was part of this, Jack Wilcox. First three or four flights, we could not get the gear up in time. The basic F-15 required all three landing gear to be weighed off wheels and the handle up before the gear started cycling. And we were going through 300 knots long before the nose gear would get up. And we had to board and come back and have to go again. So we finally rewired the airplane and as soon as the nose gear rotated off the ground the, the, and the gear handle was up, the nose gear started retracting. So if you watch any of the movies, the airplane is rolling down the, air, down the runway, the main gear is still on the deck, the nose is rotated and the landing gear is falling. <laughs> the, Air Force didn't, the Air Force brass didn't like that one bit, but uh, <laughs> the pilots did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you can hear me. I do remember, if mostly a lot of you are probably pilots in here, um, and I'm fortunate <laughs> enough to have some flying time too, but um, think about normally you wait for that airspeed to come off the, you know, the indicate first, your first indication of an airspeed rise. That's when they would raise the gear and rotate the F-15, when the airspeed indicator started to move, which is incredible, you know, usually you wait quite a while until you get to rotate speed, 
it was like when they saw the airspeed indicator, first indication of airspeed, they raised the gear, rotated the airplane. Next thing you know, they were waiting for that gear up before they hit 350 knots. You know, they needed to see that, and they almost didn't make it. It worked. But you had to hope that the, if they didn't get them up, they had to avoid right there. Plus, I'm sure if you had a problem with the, you know, the gear, or the engine at that time, that complicated your your V1 and your engine out, you know, that would be, that would be tough. <laughs> you can see some of the video where the airplane, well, first of all, they would uh, accelerate out to a given airspeed at about 50 feet off the ground and, and with, with the gear up. And you can see several of them where the airplane is descending. So, you know, most stuff that these guys, like Joe, have gone through for years, they've thought about long before the event happens. They've got a plan when the windshield breaks like your dad did on the 2-5 run. I mean, he knew he had to get his head down and get the airplane slowed down. But anyway, 2 o'clock in the morning, my phone would ring. And it'd be Pete. He'd say, John, what if this happens? Well, I, I, first of all, I'm asleep. And second of all, I don't know. Because if he didn't know, I didn't know. But I'll guarantee you, by 10 o'clock the next morning, if I didn't know, I was going to know why. <laughs> but he, he was thinking of every single possibility all the time. Okay, the, these next slides that I kind of, I just took off the flight reports that we wrote for the day at the time, and it documents the, 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 the ground temperature, the temperature and altitude when it was pertinent, the gross weight of the airplane, and basically the flight profile. This first one is the 3,000 meter profile, and as Joe pointed out, it was a basic break, I mean, a, a hold back release, accelerate to a given speed, rotate and climb to the altitude. But you can see it was, we took off on that one with about 2,000 pounds of gas, and used about 1,000 and came back over the fence with about 1,000 pounds. One thing John hasn't mentioned is the airplane would go supersonic in the climb. There would actually be uh, supersonic within 21 miles of the airport after takeoff in a climb. Now, one thing I heard Eric mentioned a minute ago, talking about when they put the gear handle up, they were seeing 150 knots in a second. From hold back release, in one second they were at 150 knots. So it was going by pretty quick. What was the weight? I see your weight here. The, the empty weight of the airplane was about 26,000 pounds. Okay. Yeah. And with gas, well, this one was 28 at, at, at break release or at, 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 at release. John, one thing that people don't realize is this airplane was built as a backup to the spin airplane because we always lost an airplane during spin programs. But we didn't need it on this program. So it was a spare airplane. But, but the, okay, this the the next flight on the same day that we did the 3,000 on the 16th of uh, January was the 6, 9, and 12 all done by, by McFarland on the same flight. And it was the same thing. Release, accelerate out to a, to a 5G pull, at uh, about 400 knots and climbed, just climbing 60 through the altitudes. And he said, when we just knocked the socks off all the records, you can read those numbers. I can't read all those numbers. But, but you can see the old record and the, and, the, and the new record that we set. And everything was broken by 20 to 30%. In fact, it's one of the rules that we were told at the time is that we had to break the records by a minimum of 10%. And the high altitude records that the Foxback came back and got a year later or whatever, they were breaking by two seconds. They were going from, you know, from 47 seconds to 45, which to me, I, I don't do math real good, but it's not 10%. <laughs> but this, okay, on the uh, 15,000 meter, as you see, the pilots were alternating, was, was Dave Peterson. And, uh, this basically was the same thing, except we used more gas and went a little higher. And uh, as you can see, we put about a thousand pounds more gas to go to, to basically 45,000 feet. Were all the ground runs about 400 feet? The yeah. Ground run, 400 feet. Yeah, about 400 feet. 
on some on these low altitude ones, he was supersonic in 20 in a vertical climb in 20 to 30 seconds. <laughs> See what are we not at 20,000? This is back. By the way, this is the only record the airplane still holds. The uh, the Russians have broken all the others in subsequent years, but uh, the the F-15 still holds the 20,000 time to climb record. And I have no idea why they didn't break this one. But it's the same same profile. The 25. All of these now. Uh, First of all, exceeded 60,000 feet. At about 55 to 60,000 feet, the burners would blow out. And as soon as the pilot felt the burners blow out, he'd cancel the other, cancel both of them back to mill power. And then at about 65,000 feet, the engines would start to go out. And he would then stop cock both engines to keep from having any asymmetry problems. And the rest of it was ballistic. He was right, they were riding the airplane over the top and uh, trying to hold angle of attack to an absolute minimum. And uh, I can remember on the on the 30,000 meter record flight that Roger was running about plus or minus 30 degrees angle of attack over the top at about 100,000 feet. And, uh, yeah, it was about 50 knots. Yeah, yeah. It was about 50. He's still supersonic. We were still supersonic. But it's but it's, it's, it's about 50 knots indicated. Yeah. And so then, you know, once you're over the top, you just push your airplane down, head down the hill, and as soon as you saw 250, 300 knots, they try to repressurize the engine and get the engines going, and then try to figure out where they were and head for home. And that was basically the chase's call, because the chase was up there, you know, at about 50 waiting on him, and he would direct the, the guy home. Whether they head into Fargo and got to go back to Grand Forks. So the next one, yeah, Venezuela. Twenty-five thousand. It's the same. Essentially, all these, all these three, the 20, 25, and thirty, are the same profile, other than the XL speed out to uh, at about thirty-five thousand feet, or thirty to thirty-five. All of these we XL either out to Mach two, two point two, or two point five, two point four, before we started the last climb. And there's the 30,000. Do you remember the max alpha or beta that they got from the 30,000 30, meter profile? The beta? Alpha and beta. Alpha was running plus or minus 30. Beta, but beta, he didn't really have a problem. There wasn't a whole lot of side slip, but you know, there wasn't a lot of surface doing anything anyway. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's the guys hooking the, the hole back up. It was a series of, of uh, aluminum links, about 40 feet long, that tied to the ground and then tied to the to the tail hook uh, mount on the airplane. We took the tail hook off and had a, had a mount there. And then there was an explosive bolt, this gizmo here, tied into it at that point. I just put this next one in because I'm in the picture. <laughs> No, the next one. Oh, okay. There we go. I'm the guy standing there, <laughs> freezing to death, getting ready to blow, blow the, the bolt. Even my fingers warm. Uh, this was the guys that worked on the airplane here in St. Louis before we ferried him. Uh, Norm and I are the only the two, kind of in, uh, Pete and then myself and Norm are the only, only two here that are here tonight. Dick Cahill, the guy just to Pete Garrison's right on that, on his, to his left, right on the picture, was the brains of the whole program. He was a product development engineer who's passed on now, but he was the guy that recognized the thrust to weight ratio of the airplane, the capability we had if we got the weight down, that we could break these records. He did the planning on the F-4 program. He, he was the flight test engineer, the job I had on the F-4 program. John, real quick, I'm gonna make it. I ran out of time. I was gonna try and cut a bunch of these for tonight, but what we'll do is upload it to our website. But Jack Evercombe sent this to me. It's actually a hundred page PDF. I pulled out the Coral and Street Eagle, but it has a very nice write-up by Dick Cahill and also uh, your dad Pete back here versus the streaker. So uh, if anybody wants to just 
pass that around and look at it, go ahead. And, uh, but I'll, we'll have that for everybody to see it. Uh, I will point out one other thing. The first time we try to go to Mach 2.5, Jack Wilcox. And I said, Jack, we got all these cracks, and I was giving him locations of frame stations, and how long they were. Norm was measuring them, and I was talking on the phone. Within two hours, he shows up in the Lear from St. Louis with about six or seven shop guys and all the sheet metal tools you needed. And we all left and went home to the hotel and came back the next morning, and the airplane was fixed and ready to fly. And those guys, I don't know what the temperature was in St. Louis, but it must have been warm because they were dressed about like I am. And it was about 20 below up there. <laughs> but he sure saved us that day. This is the airplane after they painted it, right? Before they went to the museum? No, just... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe that was. Yeah, 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 they, they wanted to paint the airplane before the flight so it would look really nice for the photographs. But the day they wanted to paint it, they would come to these guys and said they had just taken off the last 50-pound backup hydraulic system. And then they came in and said, we want to put 50 pounds of paint on it make it look pretty. And they said, well, maybe after they do the flight test. But that, you can see it like that, it went, I guess, straight to the Air Force Museum. I'm not sure yet. So, it went, so it's in the Air Force Museum. And it looks like that instead of the uh, unpainted, you know. Yeah, I thought that was This, this next photograph is the whole contingent of uh, both the Air Force, McDonnell, and uh, the data folks, the radar folks and all from that were involved. And, and a few folks in Grand Forks who were really helpful up there providing all the, all the, the help we needed. That's the last slide there. Picture of the Air Force. Norm, you got anything? I, I was looking at that previous picture, the one of the hangar door. Notice the notice the extension up there. Yeah, that's a production alert hangar that the U.S. Air Force used during the uh, Cold War. And the Air Force turned it over to us, but we flew with a boom uh, on the nose and the doors wouldn't close with that boom on there. So they took and cut out a section of that hangar door and built that box <laughs> that you see That's out there. Yeah. Now, what that, what that did for us, you gotta remember this. We got, we got a big warning from the Air Force. Don't open those doors until you turn the heat off. If you, turn, if you open the doors and the heat is on, you yeah. will not have any heat because the heaters were sitting up high and the air intake was at the floor and the temperature outside ran 20 to 30 below zero. Wow. So that cold air would come in, be sucked up to the heaters, and freeze, the heaters would be done for the winter and we would be out of luck completely. <laughs> so believe me, when I, when, I, when I got all the crew aside and I told them, I said, hey, whether I'm here or not, if you have to open those doors, for off the heaters first. <laughs> Boy, let me tell you something. Them guys got so cold up there that they, oh, they wouldn't have got that heat for nothing. And those doors are always, the heaters were always off when those doors burst and went out. But the other problem is that when the pilot, when the pilot started flight, the aircraft was sitting in that hangar, and the engines were starting. We put the pilot in the cockpit in there, and he closed the canopy. It was warm too, but <laughs> and we started engines in there because the, the back end and the front end of the hangar both open. We started engines in there and taxied out to the whole back area that John was referencing earlier. But when he came back, he also taxied into the hangar, and we had to stop him at just the right position for that thing up there. So what we did is we took the airplane and we pulled it forward until that. Boom was just right up against that cone. And we put a mark on the hangar for it. And then we backed the airplane up to where the tail was 
just clear the back door and we put another mark. And that told us that nose wheel had to end up in between those two marks when we shut down. But we were going to be sitting there jockeying the airplane back and forth in the cold. And I'll tell you what, cold is a great incentive to get people <laughs> to do it right like the first time. Right? Yeah, when it came to the tennis hole and oh, uh, yes. the garage. Great incentive. Here, right? Yeah, there, there was one other thing that, talking about the speed that the aircraft made, uh, whenever, whenever we got ready for a flight, they dictated a fuel load for the flight, and I always put extra fuel in. And the purpose for the extra fuel was what I guess we would consume going out to the hold back and getting onto the hold back, because the fuel load was at breakaway. And then what the pilot would do, once he got onto that hold back, bring the engines up, and it, as he brought them up gradually, he stretched this hold back out. Not much stretching to it, but he straightened it out. And then when he straightened it out and, and got the restraint, then the engines went forward, over into burner, and then into maximum burner. And you could sit there and listen to the pilot count down his fuel load totally. And you never saw fuel burn so fast in your life. <laughs> <laughs> but both of those engines were in maximum burner when John blew that bolt away. And down that, he, he, I've never seen an airplane get in the air so damn fast in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it got it. It really did. It, uh, no benefit of catapult. Well, let's go ahead and watch the film here, John.